Hi. Okay. Hopefully it works. Okay. So for those of you just joining on the video, we talked about lab safety. You can read about that on page three of the lab packet, the lab handout. Uh, we talked about how to evacuate the building uh, if we need to. And we hang out over by the Ferris Center and the learning objectives for the day. Make sure to be on lab on time to take the quiz. You got it? All right. Okay. All right, so we shouldn't miss more than two labs. Obviously, if you're sick with COVID and you miss three labs, I don't think I'm going to be like, well, you're out of here, right? But, uh, you know, we're trying, that's our general rule, two labs. Because once you miss more than two, you're missing like 30% of the labs, and that starts to be a significant number of labs you've missed, right? Um, I do make these recordings, and this is still kind of new to me. So like for someone who's not here today, I'll probably give them a small assignment similar to what you did, but obviously they're not going to look at pond water critters. So I might have them label the parts of a microscope and things like that uh, to make sure they learn what those are. So that kind of a thing is what might happen if you do have to miss for a legitimate reason. So after 10 minutes late, typically you're considered absent. Um, you need to do your own work and turn it in on time. Now for today, you get to do with a lab partner, you can do do partner work with that. But typically, lab assignments are on your own. And where students get in trouble, I don't know, maybe my TAs have experienced this, is when someone says, well, I just showed my friend my assignment because they wanted to see it. And then they copied it. And then, then they turn in, I get two assignments that are obviously the same thing. And then both people get a zero. And one person was trying to be nice, and the other person copied it and then both get punished for it and 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 uh, it's best to avoid those situations if possible so when you do your own work you do your own work now you can tell someone like teach them how to do something but don't just give them your work uh that's kind of de defeats the purpose of class if you miss a lab like I said typically what we want to do is get the data from your lab mates and uh and keep up you're still be responsible for that assignment unless you get a hold of them and we have to work something out, okay? So let me know, uh, especially if you know ahead of time you won't be in. All right, so did you all, I, I see some of you may not, but uh, did you, were you able to get the, the packet uh, from the bookstore, like the, the mini manual here? Just want to make sure you have that. On uh, page three are the basic lab rules. It says, which lab group are you in? You, can, you already know you're in A, I hope. And then on page four, life in the drop begins, which is the lab for today. Now on the index card at your seat, where I ask you to put your name, there's a, a letter C1 and a letter, uh, in this case, C1 and D1, it'll say C and D. C is your compound microscope number that I've assigned you, and D is your dissecting microscope number that I've assigned you. C1, D1, or in the, in the case uh, here. Now, with, depending where you're at, like the, if there was someone here, they'd be C5, D5, and so on. So if you want to write that down, um, it says, what's your dissecting scope number there under letter A on page four? You could put your number there. And there's a spot on the bottom of page five for your compound scope number. Now, if your scope has a, an issue and we need to change it out, we might swap it out for a different one until we can get the other one fixed or whatever. But that's, I thought sometimes different scopes have slightly different quirks. It's probably easier for you if you have the same scope every time. So you don't have to learn, oh, wait, this one, you got to jiggle this to get it, you know. Our scopes are pretty new, but they can be a little different depending on which one you got. Um, we have two different styles of dissecting scopes as well, so that can vary uh, as well. Okay, so um, <clears throat> dissecting scopes or dissection scopes are located in the bottoms of these cabinets here. This cabinet has D7 through D12, although it looks like D10 has walked away. That's, oh, wait, no, I got it out, didn't I? I'm not stupid. Okay, good. I already got that one out to show you. Uh, uh, so when you get these out, please put one hand under the head here and one hand on the base. Don't just carry it like this, because if this like came out, uh, the base hits the floor, 
And another thing students sometimes do is they tip them when they carry them, and then this glass plate falls off and breaks. So carry it level, both hands, especially because some parts can fall off and on some of the scopes, the lenses could fall out or something. And everything is like at least $100, so probably more. So it's best just to carry it like it's a baby. Get it to your table, all right? Um, so over there is dissecting scope one through six. And there's some extra ones over there too that are like from the 50s. Don't grab those, grab the newer ones that are labeled. Um, hopefully they're in the right spots with the number. So I'm going to go ahead and invite, let's, rather than we all bunch up in a non-social distance fashion, how about, uh, oh, by the way, just for my own sanity, this is table one. So if I say table one, two, uh, and, by the, and you can see your number on top of the table. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So if I say, hey, table five, what you got for this? Or, you know, or other things. But you know what I mean. Um, so that's what those numbers on top. Okay, so table one and uh, table five, if you want to get your microscopes, your, your comp or your dissecting scopes anyway. And then the next tables can go and so on until we're. We all have our stuff. So this side of the middle tables, this stuff will be here. And this side, your stuff will be over there. I'm table one, but and I can't open the door. Uh, there's a little tab up here, right there. Did Jackson say the heck with this and take off? Did, did he get a text or something? Um, did he did, did he get a text and then leave? I'm assuming it was something that occurred. I assume it's something. This must be very exciting for those of you watching the video. So your scope is one that someone broke glass out of, but the go to is that way we don't get stuck right on the line. All right, let's share the screen for those watching at home. Well, no one's watching at home live, but I'm, my plan is to record it and then put it on YouTube and then put the link on the lab. But it's complicated. One day we'll be able to just teach people and then they go home and they're done for the day and it'll be simple. <laughs> okay, so this microscope is called a dissecting microscope. It's used to look at three dimensional objects. Or you can look at microscope slides with it. Um, but it really shines when you look at three-dimensional objects like a fish or a bug or a leaf rather than, you know, cells under a microscope. <laughs> Let me uh, walk you through the pieces here, the important parts for us for today. Up at the top where you put your eyeballs, those are the ocular lenses, also sometimes called eyepiece lenses. They have a 10 times magnification. And they often have little numbers on them because if you have one eye, like a different prescription or something than the other, you can adjust them independently. So if you get one eye in focus and the other one blurry, you can tweak it. And they also, the lenses move. I don't want to touch someone's scopes because of the, if you just grab the lenses for a second, like both lenses like this, and then pull your hands apart, like push them together. The lenses move apart or together depending on how far apart your eyes are. Okay, to help customize it to your face. Okay, there are also sometimes little rubber caps on there that pop up or down, depending if you have glasses or not. I usually just leave them folded up, but they, they may be on there. Sometimes they fall off. Um, this is the objective lens. Objective lens. Students always miss that on quizzes and call it the magnifying lens. It's not called that, it's called the objective lens. And this is a variable power lens, and that lens can be adjusted using 
the magnification knob on the side of, of the scope. Now we have two different models of scope, but they're both pretty similar, slightly different magnification. But you'll notice there's a low power, which is like, I don't know if it's if it says zero or like point something. If we turn it all the way that way to zero point eight. And then this one goes all the way up to what? 3.5. Okay. And uh, that's what that model does. This model goes from 0.8. To four. So like this scope, for example, if I have the objective lens set at four, the eyepiece is magnified by 10. What's 10 times four? 40. So total magnification is 40 times and that one's 35 times. So they're about the same magnification depending on which model we have, about 40 times. Which is cool because the compound scopes, their lowest magnification is 40 times. So it starts where this leaves off. And then the compound scopes go all the way up to 400 times magnification. Okay, so another thing about these scopes, one of, make sure the plug in, make sure you can turn them on. I'm going to do something that I don't want students to do. And that's adjust that. There you go. All right, you'll notice this is a good time to figure out if we need to work on our outlets or something. If you can't get your scope to come on, let me know. Yours is on. Are you having trouble? Yeah. Did you break it? Did you bring the checkbook? Uh, power's working. So, there you go. Just turn the knob. Uh, the knobs brighten and dim. There's two different light sources. The knobs that you'll see that can rotate. Turn on those different light sources. One from above. Let me just crank the little knob over here. So one light comes from the bottom, one light comes from the top. So you can adjust them. I know some of them, the knobs need tightening, you gotta fiddle with them a bit. I, I need to get an Allen wrench. I think like this one looks kind of that way. It kind of slips a little, but it does work. So if you're looking at something that's clear and you can see through, it's a good idea to try the light from the bottom. If you're looking at something like your hand, you might want to use the light from the top because it's not going to go through your hand, right? Um, then there is simply one focus knob on the side. And if you just crank the focus knob and look at what happens to them, don't look in it, just don't look in the lenses, just look at the scope. You'll see that that entire headpiece goes up and down, right? That's how it focuses. This, of course, is called the stage. The stage is where you put the thing you're going to look at. Okay, so first things first, let's just do something easy. I don't know, use your pen or your lab manual or your hand and lay it on the stage. You can, if you want to use your hand, you can remove, remove that for now. Lay it on there. Make sure you have the scope first set at the lowest magnification. So 0.8 or whatever it is. And then look into the lenses. Make sure the light's coming from above and make sure the light's aimed at your hand. You can't aim the upper light. You might have to move it. It rotates. For example, you might want to, you know, you can aim it wherever you want it. And then look in there and play with the course focus to see if you can get your, your object in focus. And then you're going to want to turn this light on. Probably this one, maybe. I don't know which one to do with it. Rotate either one. Oh, that's the other one. Okay. Turn that one down. It's pretty much. There you go. Now put your hand under there and you can, you can aim it. Okay. So crank on that until you get it in focus and then you can try zooming in. Now you can adjust these individually. If you look, uh, this bend, and that's the that's how you get it. Yeah. Appreciate you. Uh -huh. So then, once you can see the object, you're aim that light down there. There we go.
So what we're going to do now is uh, try to focus on a microscope slide. That way you can see the maximum power of this scope and kind of give you a feel of where the, the compound scope picks up when we, when we try that one. It will be a bit of a trick sometimes to focus on something as small as pollen grains with these scopes, but I'm confident you'll be able to be able to do it. And you can try shutting the overhead light off on your scope. That might help. Uh, it might be too glary otherwise you can play around with it, but likely you're going to have to crank quite a bit on the focus knob to get the lens closer to the slide because your hand or your pen is a big 3D object. So the, the, the objective lens has to be way above it, whereas that slides really flat and the lens will have to be a lot closer to it to see it clearly. Uh, the next table can go ahead and tables two, one and, and I'm five can, can go ahead and then I, I should have started with the middle table, so I'm sorry. I'll let you guys get your next scope next. How's that? <sighs> 70, huh? Remember your C1B1? We got 95 in the back. And we want to make. By the way, if uh, later on when it comes to time to take pictures, if anyone wants to try one of these, we have a whole drawer of them. This part clamps to your objective lens and this part clamps to your cell phone. And, it, and then it takes a little tweaking. That's the, that's the, the downside. You got to align everything. But then your phone is like lined up with your scope and you can easily take pictures and video. Otherwise, you know, you can hold your phone up to the lenses to get pictures. It's just that part's a little trickier, but but uh, it depends if you're if you'd rather spend time aligning this or playing around with how you're holding your phone to get good pictures. Either way will work. All right, so lay that slide on there. You might zoom back out to low power. Always start at low power. Find the slide, then zoom, then zoom all the way in. And the pollen will be in the middle of that slide. I think the cover slips on these slides are mostly round. So it'll be in that round little cover slip in the middle of the slide. And if, if of course, if the light's too bright, you can dim it using the, uh, the rheostat, rheostat's the fancy word for those knobs that brighten and dim the light. And so instead of aiming it away, you can just. Yeah, well, that one's always really well. Yeah, do that. <laughs> I wasn't going but to. Don't lose the, the knob. Yeah. You need, I need I to get an Allen wrench set for this lab. That's what I need to do. Is that a tiny little Allen wrench? Would you, let's look at it. Is it tiny, tiny? Or is it kind of in? Yeah, that's pretty small though. All right. I will tell the prep guy in a little bit that we need an Allen wrench set. Okay. Now, I don't expect you to be astounded by what you can see at 40x with these scopes with the pollen grains. I expect you'll be able to see little colored dots. That's my hope like a little maybe red, blue dots in there. Maybe a little more detail than that. Darn any luck. Can you see little colored dots in there? Yep. Okay, so at your bench, I do have a binder. And you won't be able to tell this now, but one of the images in the binder is a key to the different kinds of pollen that you'll have. You probably won't be able to tell it apart right now because the magnification is just not too Great, but have you been able to see anything in there? Okay. All right. So that's the dissecting scope. Does anybody need help? 
I shouldn't do it this way. Does anybody not need help? Who's okay? All right. Who's ready to move on? All right. So compound scope. You're going to carry it the same way. If anyone is not comfortable reaching all the way up here to grab a compound scope, the shelf is kind of high, just let me know. You're not comfortable. All right, well, you're going to start anyway. What's your, what's your scope number? Um, 13. 13, lucky 13. See how I'm carrying the scope? And then we'll set it down. You're welcome. All right. All right, so, uh, well, she's done. You guys can go and uh, free for all. I don't know. Uh, back tables go. How's that? I'm not going to be so cautious directing everyone after a while. We'll figure it out. But leave that slide at your bench because you're going to look at it with your content scope in a moment. I'm going to come back to that slide in a bit. Okay. There's a few more parts to these compound scopes that we'll want to work on. Uh, the other tables can go as soon as the uh, back tables are finished. Is okay? So these scopes will also sometimes appear to not work because sometimes either the switch is off or the lights dim. There's a light dimmer switch or rheostat on the side of these scopes that will brighten and dim the light. And when we put the scopes away and when you first start using them, we always put them on the lowest magnification, which is the little stubbiest lens first. Did you want some help? Yeah, which scope is yours? Four or five and four. four. There we go. If you want, since obviously the whole row is empty, we could just switch you to like 11 and then you don't have to worry about it. Would you be more comfortable with that as well if we just switch you to one of them on the lower shelf so then you don't have to reach up there to grab it? If so, we can just decide which one of 19 to 24 you want. And go to town. Is yours working okay? Yeah, there is a lot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, so is it all or not? Okay. Okay. So for this microscope, let's walk through the parts and I'm going to talk to you about what they do. I did it in the pre lab video, but I'm trying to decide whether to have you have a slide under there while I talk about it. I think first look at me and then play around with it all with the slide. Okay. All right. Ocular lenses, once again, they move apart and together to, uh, to adjust for eyes. And I think at least one of them typically might spin to adjust for, uh, uh, but I'm, these scopes are a little different than some. I don't see numbers on these. So, oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, but typically we'll be able to get them to work for you. Now, uh, just like with the, I didn't mention this before, but don't do this. There's a set screw right there. Just like on the front of your dissecting scope, there's a set screw that lets the head pivot. Don't, don't screw with that screw. The worst microscope accident I have witnessed was when I was a teacher, fresh out of grad school. I was a, I was a brand new teacher, a visiting instructor at Hendricks College in this town called Conway. I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, it's not too far from here, but uh, the student grabs their microscope, walking back to their bench, and someone had done this, like they had a lab partner, and they're like, hey, look in here, look, oh, cool, I'll look too. They didn't tighten it when they were done, and the head went, Whoa! and it hit the ground, and pieces of glass fell out. It was like uh, probably a $1,500 repair. We don't want to have that problem. So just if, if, if we're not going to share with lab partners very much this semester anyway, but if we did, it's better just to go 
move the whole scope rather than pivot that head because if we forget to tighten those, it leads to issues. And you might always just give the head a little, little wiggle, make sure it's tight because you never know what the person who used the scope before you did. All right, so this is the objective. That, well, they call this the nose of the scope, but these are the objective lenses. There's more than one here. Objective lenses. Your scope has four of them, but we're only going to use three of them. We're going to use the four, the 10, and the 40. There's one on there that's got white, a white stripe on it. That one's 100. That one's an oil immersion lens. You'll use those when you take microbio. We're not going to use them this semester. They require you to put oil on your slide and then it gets on everything. And I don't want to do that in here. So we're not going to do that. <clears throat> but beneath the objective lenses is the stage. The stage has a silver clip. Carefully take your pollen slide and place it onto the stage. You'll cock back that little arm on, this, on the clip and it will squeeze this, the slide into place. Joe, you want to check on these tables, make sure they get their slide stuck in properly because sometimes it's a bit perplexing to, if they haven't used the scope before. Thank you. Then, then you got it under control. Cool. Got it. Got it. Just get this. Yeah, put, put it right up like this. Everyone good? Okay, now that it's in place, there's an upper and lower stage control knob that will move your slide around so you can steer the slide left and right and back and forth without actually touching the slide. So go ahead and just try that. Try these little stage control knobs and look at the slide. I mean, you don't have to look through the eye, but physically look at the slide and see how it moves so you understand what's happening. It should move around. Sometimes when you make a wet mount and you use too much water, the wet mount will stick to the stage because of capillary action and then the stage controls will be a little awkward to operate. So keep that in mind, you might have to unstick the slide. Okay, so that's the stage and the stage controls. Underneath the stage is the iris diaphragm. It rotates on your, well, it has a little lever on your scope, I believe, and it will, it will tell you approximately what magnification you might wanna, uh, when you're on a certain mag, which setting to use on the iris diaphragm. The iris diaphragm lets different amounts of light through to this slide. So that way you can leave the light bulb at a certain brightness and you can tweak the brightness with the iris diaphragm because the biggest problem students have, the biggest problem students usually have when using the compound scope is they often have too much light. Meaning, and then when you have too much light, you can't see little microbes very well. You can't see organisms very well because they wash out from the brightness. Okay, uh, the iris diaphragm is attached to this larger unit here, which actually has a lens in it and it's called the condenser. It focuses light on the specimen. So the light goes into the condenser, focuses on the slide, and then the iris diaphragm lets more or less light through the condenser. And your condenser can go up and down, and there's a little lever on the side of your stage, and I usually put the condenser all the way up, so it's as close to the slide as possible. I'm not sure when you make the condenser sink all the way down. Do you have any idea, Joe? I've never had a reason to do that. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so maybe for cleaning. I don't know. By the way, if you ever have to clean your scopes, uh, in terms of like wiping on them and everything, only ever use lens cleaner. That's that spritzy bottle back there. Not like, <clears throat> don't get them with like, I don't know, Lysol, lens cleaner only. And we only want to use lens wipe, lens wipes. And uh, Joe, you might, Check, it, check out the uh, drawers over here. We have a drawer here called Microscope Miscellaneous. Lens, lens wipes come in these little packets. Don't use Kim wipes, which look like Kleenex in a box. You, those will scratch lenses. We want to use lens paper only, lens wipes or lens tissues, okay? So if you need, we need to clean. Sometimes we need to clean these because the lenses get wet when we make pond water slides and then they kind of get cloudy. So keep that in mind. Okay. 
Now, uh, on one side of your scope, there will be a big knob with a little knob sticking out of it. The big knob there is the course focus. If you crank on it, the stage goes up and down. And if you crank on the fine focus, you won't really see anything happen. At least not while you're just looking at the scope. So on the other side of the scope, there's just a fine focus knob on this model. Uh, there is a light switch, of course, here and a rheostat, so a brighten and dim the light thing there. And uh, the light source is down here. That's where the light bulb is. And so those are the major parts of the scope. Now, if you're having trouble seeing something, I usually I usually leave my light bulb at like a <coughs> medium brightness, and then I play with the, the uh, iris diaphragm. And if I dim the iris diaphragm all the way down and it's still too bright, then I turn down the light bulb a bit. Um, now, what I'd like you to do then is to put the scope on the lowest mag, which is the stubbiest slide, the one with the red line on it that says 10x. Make sure that's clicked into place. By clicked into place, I mean it's the furthest, the back setting. Uh, and move the, the stage control until the slide is in the middle of the stage, right above the uh, condenser. And then I want you to try to find those pollen grains like you did before. Don't change the magnification yet, just find the pollen grain. And the best way to do that is to start <coughs> with, the, with the stage pretty far down, and then look in the lenses and crank on the course focus knob. Uh, little bit. Uh, so, so crank, you're on at least 10, it go to the little red lens, there you, go, right, there you go. So look in there and crank on the course focus now, bring in the stage upwards until something comes in focus. A lot of times when you're looking at a slide, the first thing you'll focus on will be like the edges of the cover slip before you can actually see the specimen. You just need something to kind of define and focus on. Once you have it in focus, you can use the fine focus to, to get it just right. The coarse focus gets it pretty close, the fine focus gets it just right. Then we get into some important instructions here. You can click to the next power, which is 10x. And after you've done that, these scopes are supposed to be par focal, which means once you have it in focus, it should be pretty close to in focus at the next power length. So you click to the next power lens, and at that point, you probably only need to use the fine focus now and not the coarse focus. And it's important once you go all the way up to 40x, the biggest lens, because it almost touches the slide, that it's important that once you're at that power, you do not use the coarse focus now because it's quite possible to ram the lens into the slide and break one or both. So when we get to the higher power magnifications, we only touch the fine focus to, to get it. In focus. And if it's not in focus, go back to a lower mag, get it in focus at a lower mag, then come back to 40x and adjust the fine focus. So what I want you to do is eventually here get your pollen to be visible at 40x. That's the that's the big blue lens, the longest lens, and get a picture of it and show me that you have found it. That you've been able to get your scope in focus at that power. And if then once you can see it, you can look at that key of pollen grains at your bench and figure out whose pollen you're looking at. Because there's lots of different species in there. And Joe and I will be happy to walk around and assist you. Because this this one, this can be tricky for a first timer or someone who hasn't done it for a while. So don't feel bad to ask for help. Joe, do you do microscope stuff with your research? Uh, dissecting the cell. I've spent many hours staring into the scope lens doing paleontology stuff, so, so don't feel bad. Now, see, your, your lens is looking here, and your slide's way back there. So you'll want to bring it closer, and I would brighten that. Right now, your light's off, so your light's not on.
What are we seeing? Nothing yet or something? Okay. So, I mean, they will uh, get what, what's on there. That and make dust from the room. But uh, so if you want to click, eventually you want to go to the next higher power and see what you can see. How about, how are you doing? You, okay. Now see if you can get them at the next powerful end. So once we plunge it in 40, can you take a picture? Yeah, show me that. That's uh, that's your your ticket to move on to the other things. Any work, Ben? Okay. All right. So are you seeing anything yet? For me, I wonder. Can I? Um, Breathing on me. And we, uh, so, what, so right now I see nothing. So I crank on this, on this while I'm looking, and then suddenly, all I did was crank on that four coat knob. You see the difference? You see those colored specks? Now we can see the pollen grains in there. And now you can work on moving the slide where you want it and going to higher and higher power. But the only the issue was the the lens and the slide were way too far apart. Doing okay? I'm pretty sure I ended up feeling like a on that. It's not too bad. If you think it's going to be an issue later, we can we can wipe it down. But it does get a little grainy looking at high power, and that could be part of it. And if you move, have you looked around? Have you seen any other examples of those? The only ones you've seen. There should be lots of different. Yeah. Here's here's the. The pictures of the different kinds that you'll be able to find. Doing okay? Yes. How about you? Okay, now uh, try to get it at this one. It's a higher power. It got it. Got it. And uh, here's a key to the different kinds of pollen that are in there. I'm not making you key them out, but it's just kind of interesting instead of just random blobs to see what you're looking at. I don't think you're going to see anything right now. The reason being is your slide, when it's focused properly, will be at that mag will be practically touching the slide. So you want to back off to a little mag and work your way back. What's that? What I would do is back up at least one more, maybe all the way back, because you don't want to just start at high mag, because that's that's usually not going to work out well. Don't you have a, I heard it home. Um, is it normal to only be able to focus on a few of them at once? Yes. The reason you can only see a few at a time at high mag is the depth of field gets more and more narrow as you get to higher power, meaning you, you can't see as deep into the slide at once as you can when you're looking with a lower power. In fact, with some of the bigger pollen grains, you can only see like the outer edge or the inner part at a time. You know, parts of them will go in and out of focus as you change them. Did you make us a spritzer bottle of alcohol yet? I did. We, we should probably label it, don't you think? Yeah, I got it. I just put 70 All right, then. Okay. So we do, by the way, have some 70% ethanol here that when we're done today, we kind of just sort of spritz our scopes with a bit to the parts we touched anyway to uh, sterilize them. And then, of course, there are there are wipes by the door. You can wipe down your bench with at the end of the day. Okay, I see your pollen drain. Once you show me your pollen grain <coughs> or grain, then what I want you to do is to come over here and get a, a dropper full of station two tetrahymena and put it in a watch glass, one of these right here, and then look at it with your dissecting scope to see if you can find anything in there. And then after we see if there's anything in there or not, we'll make a slide out of it and look at it with a compound. So. Taking the pollen back would be good. 
You can put the pollen back in the metal tray once you've shown me your photograph. Um, is there a way to protect the photographs from just having a tiny circle? Well, what I usually do is if I have a tiny circle, I zoom in and crop. <laughs> what I do when I take photos, and I, I uh, put my hand in a ring around the uh, lens and I lay my phone on my hand and I change how far the, the camera is from the lens by moving my hand. But I'm going to fix this real quick. Just fall off. There we go. I don't know why they do that. Okay, I think so. Yeah. There should be like different spiky ones. And I can't tell it. Can I show it now? Yeah. You see, it could be that it's dirty, or right now your lens is too far away, so I know that won't work. But uh, go back. So there is more in focus. The plate will still be focused. So all I did was. I looked in there while I clicked to the next lens and I could still see they were maybe slightly fuzzy and you only touch the fine focus. And then I usually don't don't ever touch the coarse focus once I've left the smallest lens typically anyway. Doing okay? I forget if I checked. There you go. All right, so you can go ahead and get some drops from station two. I certainly can. Let's start at this lens. Now, have you seen anything with that lens? So if you look in there right now, do you see anything or do we need to crank, probably need to crank on the focus a little bit? Because look in there while you crank on it, it's still colored out here. Okay. I think they've got it back here. If you want to check these tables, and then oh, I should probably pause the recording too, so I don't bore the hell out of the world. Hi. We're going to. Okay, so what we're going to do with uh, the pond water and the tetrahymena slide um, is. We're going to make a wet mount, and I bet a lot of you have done this already in the past, but it may have been a while. So let me just walk you through how that works. So you take a drop uh, and you put it on a fly. Okay, everyone good so far. Okay, and then what you do, you have a slide with a drop of water on it. You lay a cover slip kind of in the edge of that drop of water at about a 45 degree angle, and you let it drop down. And when it drops down, it flashes that drop of water and pushes the air bubbles out. So you have a drop of water here, put the cover slip on. And so don't just drop it flat on, lay it at an angle kind of in that, the edge in the drop of water, let it fall and it'll push the air bubbles out. Now um, that's called a wet mount. Um, that's what, you, what we would use to look at living things in pond water, stuff like that. Or even a slide of like a real, of a piece of leaf tissue or something. We might use water just to keep that cover slip stuck down to the to the slide. Um, like I said, you can put up to two samples on these slides usually with our cover slip. The cover slips are usually anyway made of glass, so be careful with them. Uh, don't you know cut yourself on them. Um, so slides are in these boxes here, these big boxes. Cover slips are in these smaller boxes. I have a couple of stations of slides. Uh, there's some here here and there, so that way we don't have to all bunch up in one spot. And uh, what you'll do is you just put one drop, typically, of the sample on the slide with the cover slip on. Now, I did it earlier. I saw some critters out of that beaker. There weren't as many as I'd hoped, but 
There were some. So I'm hoping you'll be able to find some and it won't just be like, well, that was clear. Um, so I want you to try it. And um, you can use the sample you have, or if you want a fresh sample, usually with with pond water, with stuff like this, the gunkier your sample, although that one doesn't have a lot of gunk in, there is some like fog in there. The gunky stuff is where things live and eat. And sometimes the gunky stuff is the organism. It just depends what you're looking at. But things like to hide. If you get a clear piece of sample of water from like the top of a of a bowl of pond water, chances are there's gonna be nothing in there. Because things like to hide. Things like to eat, and they're where the food is, they're where the gunk is, they hide in that gunk. To us, it looks like dirt, to them, it looks like a place to hide, right? So you want gunk on your slide so you can find things. So you're going to try the tetrahymena first. I'm hoping it'll work for you. If not, later labs, I'll have a fresher sample, but your first slide will be, we're going to see if this one works. Um, then I have a sample of uh, several bits of pond waters. I saw at least one or two of you brought in your own pond water, but we're going to start with tetrahymena. And then, then you can get samples of the pond water or these other water samples. I have no idea what might be in these. That one, I'm sure there's stuff in. No idea about these, but we'll look. And you're going to try to look for a couple of specific things. Okay. So let me walk you through kind of the overall plan. So that way I don't have to keep interrupting you. Okay. And that way I don't have to keep recording. So. <clears throat> Here's a quick one. Let's pretend this was a quiz. Let's, uh, let's not worry about the top arrow. For bonus points, let's pretend. <clears throat> what do you call that whole top thing? I didn't have it labeled before, but maybe someone knows. No one? The head, it's the head. But what if, uh, but what if this was pointed right here? What do you call these things? Ocular lenses. What do you call, what would you call this thing? Stage, Stage controls. Okay, well, good job, everybody. All right. What do you call these lenses? Not the specific lens, but these lenses. And I told you they're not called magnifying lenses. So what are they called? Objective lenses. What is that knob? Course vote. Fine and course. Okay. Uh, what? Okay, we already did those lenses. What is? What would we call that thing? That knob on a dissecting scope. Uh, magnification. magnification knob versus the focus knob. They have two knobs on those, magnification, uh, magnification and focus, right? Two big knobs anyway. All right. Okay, so you're going to look at a tetrahymena slide and try to see if you can find the critters on there. If you remember from bio one, these are the same critters that we fed ink to and tried to see endocytosis. So that's what those are, just see if you can find them. They're in the phylum ciliophora. So they're ciliates, they swim with cilia, they're single-celled uh, eukaryotic organism. Meanwhile, you're also gonna look at pond water slides. It is February, so it may not be as abundant as we would like, but we're gonna try. Um, we may see lots of different kinds of critters in there. You could see animals, for example, or algae, or diatoms, or, or, or whatever. You'll find lots of potential things in there. Uh, there's a link on the lab website if you have a device with you with a key to pond water organisms. And I laid some physical picture keys out to help you identify things as well. Um, so what I'm going to have you do is, is try to find some different categories. And, and uh, we're going to do the best we can. Knowing that it's winter, uh, we'll see how good the samples are, how stringent I'll be as to how many things you should really find. But I do have a list that you're going to try to look for. Um, so you have a key. I'm going to move on here in a second, but you have a key. So if I left this up, I'm sure I'm certain you could uh, flip through the pictures and figure out who these organisms are. Um, anyone want to give it a quick try? I see some folks looking. A copepod, potentially. A water flea. I'm hearing lots of answers, but they're all close because they're all at least crustaceans. So water flea, copepod, those are all related organisms. 
By the way, there are some uh, picture uh, posters in the back of the room to help us out later as well. A lot of students like those. Let's look at what uh, survey says. Copepod, who said copepod? I heard it, oh, here we go. And waterfully, good job. They're both crustaceans related to, uh, you know, crawl, crawdads and other things. Ooh, which of the following? Are we, I'm not gonna hit you. This will not be a quiz question, but uh, you may see lots of different kinds of organisms. What's amazing is some of these rotifers are smaller than some of the ciliates, but these are multicellular animals and these are single cell organisms. So you might see things that will like, whoa, that's, a, that's an animal and this is a single cell and they're the same size or what, you know, there's some weird scale differences in some of those organisms in the water. So rotifers can be the same size as big ciliates, even though they're multicellular animals. And single cell flagellates, you might see those with hairs whipping around. You can see all kinds of things if we have good water samples. If we have bad water samples, you'll be like this lab was horrible. If it's good water samples, you'll be like, wow, that was cool. But I can't control the weather. So we're gonna do our best. Okay, now um, I'm just gonna move, move on. Uh, at the end of the day, we're gonna clean up. And I want, all, <clears throat> I want the tables to double check those stations to make sure there aren't like cover slips spilled out. We'll want to keep the cover slips shut so they don't get dirty. So that a lot of times students will like knock the cover slips over and that becomes a real mess. So we want to make sure that the lab looks okay because tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. another lab's in here and the TA is probably not going to get here much before lab begins to like, oh, I'll spiff up the lab. Probably not. They'll walk in and go, what the hell happened back here? We don't want to be the people that uh, made that happen. So let's make sure it looks good. And we wrap up our cords loosely uh, on the compound scopes and the dissectors so they fit in the, in the ca uh, cabinets nicely uh, and they're not dangling in, in the way. And, and we always put the uh, lenses in the lowest objective setting when we put them away. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is that uh, the assignment I told you I shared it with you. Um, it looks kind of like this. You can save it as a PowerPoint if you want, or you can just make your own Google Doc copy and edit it. I don't care. Uh, but you're going to make your own copy. Don't edit mine. Make your own copy. Put your group members' names on it and your table number. So one, two, three, four, five, six, however, unless you two want to pair up. Um, and it has a couple of instructions. One, take a picture of your compound scope and label the bold parts in your manual. It'll be like eyepiece, da, 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 da. So just all you got to do is put the picture of the scope in there, put a text box and a line from the text box pointing at that part of the microscope, right? Not too hard. Same thing with dissector scope, label the bold terms in your manual. If you get a good picture of tetrahymena, put it in there. Um, oh, we're going to skip the group member's hand since there's COVID going around. Otherwise, I'd have you focus on your hands under the, we're going to skip that one. Um, then what you're going to look for in the pond water sample, a single celled autotroph. What's an autotroph? Somebody that makes their own food. Exactly. A multicellular autotroph. That would be like a strand of algae. That's a bunch of cells long, right? A ciliate, other than tetrahymena. <laughs> an animal, that could be a worm or an insect larvae or, or something. And then if you find something, you're like, what the heck is that? Other. Right, so something else. Um, and um, take a picture of your microscopes correctly put away at the end of the day. But I was thinking about this. Well, let me check with the, 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 the we have another, you want to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Sarah. I'm TA the There you go, another TA. You have all this extra help in this lab section. So I'm debating whether to leave the scopes out so we don't bunch up and have to get them out each day or whether students should have to put them away and get them out each day of this lab. What, what do the TAs think? Just leave them out for the week. One last step for y'all, as long as you clean them, you know, nuke them before you leave, just hit them with a little F and also we, we kill all of our germs off of them. All right, so we'll leave them out. We might dig, dig in the prep room and see if we have those little plastic bags we could stick over. My, I know we had them, but where they are now, I'm not sure. Anyway, so, all right, so we're going to get off easy. We're going to skip the picture of the scopes put away for this week, and we're going to skip the group member hands as well, okay? But we're going to try for the other. And once again, 
I'm going to have you do them as tables, the assignment as a table. So one person, uh, and you don't turn this in on Blackboard, you just put it in that shared folder uh, and rename it with your group number, like group five or whatever, and put it in that shared folder. That's how you turn it in, okay? And so we're going to start with Tetrahymena. See if you can find those, get a picture of those. That's one of the things you should get a picture of. Get a picture of your own scope too, because you're going to have to label the parts. And then um, you can work your way. You can try the different pond water samples. Um, here I got at least one of these. I don't know two of these, one of these. There are two samples here. Um, both of these. This one's out of my front yard, out of the pond. And this one's out of the, out of the greenhouse. I have some tanks in there that hold water all year round. So we'll see. So that's what we got. I, I might get some Lake Conway water later this week if I didn't say, but sometimes when it's cold, I find out really nothing in there. So we'll see. Anyway, so I'm done. I'm done yapping. There are slides back there. Remember, when you're done with the slides that you make wet mounts with, they go in the glass disposal. When you're done with the uh, watch glasses, clean them off and put them back over there by the window. And when you're done for the day, I think I will have you wrap the cords up on your scopes so no one's catching them with their legs and dragging scopes off the tables and set everything at the lowest mag possible and just put them towards the middle of the table so they're not near an edge. Okay. And uh, go to town. <laughs>